So thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm excited to talk about this vision of a queerable earth and, and how we all get there together. Um, so a little bit about me, I wear a few different hats um, and you'll see these perspectives throughout the talk. The, the primary hat is Planet. I work there three days a week um, doing a bunch of product stuff. Uh, I'm also the Radiant Earth's first technical fellow. Uh, this gives me uh, time to work on, on standards and you'll see a lot of that. I'm also on the board of the OGC, um, the Open Geospatial Consortium, which makes geospatial standards and have been attempting to guide them to embrace more open source principles. Um, my background is really true and true open source geospatial software. So GeoServer was the first project that I worked on. Um, I was a founding member of OSGeo, so talking to this community really feels like home. So pretty excited to, to be here and deliver this message. Um, today I'm gonna talk about how we can help geospatial information and software live up to the promise that we all feel. Um, I'm going to go out on a limb and posit that most people in this room understand the power of geospatial. Um, you've devoted your professional lives to it. Uh, you've made a conscious effort to be here. Uh, you're learning more, collaborating with others. You've seen that it can give incredible insight, um, can improve decisions, and, and make the world a better place. But how many times have you tried to explain that to somebody else and, you know, you spend a couple minutes and talk about it and then you just end up saying, eh, it's like Google Earth, you know, like it, it's hard to really articulate um, the power of geospatial, and so you just leave it at that. Um, so I actually believe it's possible to make that power obvious to everyone. Um, it's just that we're still quite early in this journey of geospatial information living up to its promise. So at Planet, our CEO uses this term, queerable Earth, uh, which I find a, a really useful vision uh, for bringing the power of geospatial to everyone. Um, the goal is to index the planet and make it searchable, just like Google indexes the web. Um, this is a, a mock-up of that vision, um, where a normal user can get information about the planet. Um, the user can uh, see dashboards, they can see port activity in Vancouver, uh, floods in, in Houston, um, and they're not having to learn a bunch of really specific geospatial stuff to get a, a picture of what's happening. And indeed, people should be able to, to ask queries about the Earth. Um, how many miles of new road were built in China this month? Uh, how much deforestation happened in the state of Pará in the last week? or in the last day? And could you notify me automatically what that happens in an area where deforestation is illegal and we can go do something about it? Um, our corn yields in Iowa predicted to be more than last year. Um, so before I dive deep into this queerable Earth vision, I'd like to explore two major trends in geospatial. Um, I believe we're at a, a turning point in the geospatial world that opens up the potential for really bold new directions. And the, the first of those is the explosion of data. Um, the big driver of this data explosion has been mobile devices, um, and not just the actual devices, but the trillions of dollars invested refining every single component uh, that powers a cell phone. And the benefits of this gargantuan investment are, are trickling out to make an impact in many other domains. Um, in location, the most obvious is that every connected device now generates location data with ease. This is a GPS chip, you can embed that anywhere, there's other ways to get location. Um, you know, so this, this investment is enabling location in all our devices. Um, Planet Labs took um, that technology investment from computer electronics and leveraged it to make small, highly capable spacecraft. Uh, this is the Dove satellite, uh, the result of several years of agile iteration. Uh, my colleague Jesse talked about this in 2015, how we're building satellites with a mission to image the entire planet every single day. Um, I'm gonna skip over most of the planet story today. Um, it's been articulated elsewhere and it's pretty exciting, except to report one thing, which is uh, last year we launched more than 150 satellites and we've accomplished that first mission. We're imaging the entire Earth every day. This is a, a super cool uh, video of our 88 of our satellites being ejected into space, which makes up the a good bulk of that constellation. Um, so, this planet constellation is pulling down tons of data every day, um, over a million images with 180 Dove satellites, and those have been complemented by assets from two acquisitions, the RapidEye satellites and 13 SkySat satellites that are uh, capable of 80 centimeter resolution. 
And it's not just Planet producing lots of data. Digital Globe has five incredible satellites producing millions of square kilometers. Airbus has a, a bevy of satellites. Um, the Sentinel series has launched six satellites already, and all of these have many more planned. Um, launch is also getting cheaper, so there's more and more companies, and that barrier to get into space uh, is less. So there's new nano rocket companies coming on uh, with smaller launch vehicles, um, but they'll still carry a number of CubeSats and smaller satellites. This is a, a rocket lab launch, and Planet was uh, one of the first payloads to go up on it. Um, the other part of the data explosion is that the cloud has actually made a lot more data accessible. So even though we were producing lots of data with Landsat, with others, normal people and even experts couldn't really use it unless they spent lots of time accessing it. Um, so this Landsat on AWS project was originally a collaboration between Planet, Amazon, USGS, Mapbox, and Esri um, to make the data on the cloud and accessible. And the cool thing is once it was accessible, the use of the data uh, just shot up. So the effective data explosion was much greater in the last few years than just the actual amount of new data because it's accessible. Um, so Amazon has actually built on the success of that project and has many, many data sets available on their cloud. Um, data is available on other clouds. So this accessing with ease has really contributed substantially to this data explosion. Um, and these trends are only accelerating. Uh, this is number of satellites launched, um, and rest assured, many more are planned. Um, and remember that each satellite launched in 2017 is far more capable than one of the ones launched in the 90s. So it's just generating massive amounts of data. Um, so how is remote sensing handling this data explosion? Um, you know, we have this data online, more coming on every day. Um, and the big problem is that the standard remote sensing process only scales with more people. This is an image I found online um, that is indicative. There's a, a person uh, sitting at a desktop, um, and, and that's kind of a key step in this traditional process. And you know, all kinds of really cool analysis is possible, but it depends on a person sitting down, operating their machine, bringing their human ingenuity for the best results. Um, so you need that person the loop. But with millions of images coming down, it's just too much information for traditional remote sensing. Even if we hire 10 times or 100 times the number of people, it's just still too much. Um, so that brings us to the second major trend transforming geospatial. Uh, right as this explosion of data is becoming too much for anyone to deal with, we've had incredible advances in computer vision um, that have the potential to absolutely transform how remote sensing works. So. My guess is most people in this audience have some exposure to the advances in computer vision. It's this ability to automatically identify what's in a, a photo. Um, you know, pull out these cars, pull out that building. Um, most of these advances in computer vision in particular are based on this fundamental data set called ImageNet. Um, it's got uh, over a million images with a thousand object classes um, that is what the algorithms learn from. And every year, they hold a contest to see who is best able to identify objects and images. Um, and it's been improving drastically every year. Um, in 2015, they actually got more accurate than human standard error rates of 5%. And the key to this drop is what's called deep learning. Um, so deep learning works more like the human brain. Uh, it has to be trained on images. Um, the computer model is fed millions of images, um, told what they are, and it sort of figures out itself how to tell them apart. Uh, it uses a bunch of different layers. This is a, a sort of in-browser animation of these different layers. One might identify lines, one circles, one faces, and then from all of that, it'll will give an answer. Um, and the cool thing is, once these are trained, that part is really computationally expensive. But once they're trained, they operate really fast. This is, again, running in a browser. Um, so pretty powerful. Um, so with all this incredible um, computation power, the industry has gotten really good at drawing boxes around cats and dogs. Um, thankfully, they started to go beyond just boxes to what they call image segmentation, which is clearly a lot more relevant to our field of uh, geospatial and imagery. Um, to me, the one sad thing about all this incredible research, though, is that most of the applications are for helping people tag their cats in photos or identify their friends in selfies. And I, I appreciate these as a consumer, but 
what if that same technology could be used to help save our planet? Um, with the amount of imagery overwhelming normal remote sensing workflows, I'm more and more convinced that computer vision and deep learning is what will help us make use of all this imagery being generated. I think we'll see a leapfrogging of traditional remote sensing techniques using deep learning algorithms to identify relevant change on Earth. Um, we're starting to see some fairly incredible results even early on. Uh, I've seen models reach 90% accuracy with only 100 sample images. Now, getting to 100% accuracy is obviously a lot harder, but traditional remote sensing has been often quite happy if they can get to 85% even after lots of optimization. Um, so there's been early success identifying a number of objects and land cover classes. At Planet, we've got an imagery analytics team that has been exploring what's possible. Um, many others are doing similar experiments. These are in no way exclusive to Planet. It's just where these examples are, are coming from. Ships have proven to be one of the easiest for most since, you know, you just check over water. The shapes are pretty distinctive. Um, planes are another popular object. Um, counting cars for retail friends. Trends, this is a... Uh, experiment we did with could we use the high resolution where you can make up the cars, combine it with the medium resolution to get the area and identify those trends daily. Um, land use classification uses the image segmentation deep learning technologies. This one is uh, a pretty, you know, three class, not super complex, but it's really quite powerful, especially if you run it weekly. So you can see the red being the change that's happening. Um, identifying what is forest and what is not forest. Um, similar techniques are used for buildings. Uh, this is a project to detect urban growth that we did with World Bank in Tanzania to, you know, could we identify the buildings automatically and, and see that growth and, and change. Um, road detections are similar techniques. And then there's more niche objects like uh, oil well pads and rigs to determine where new infrastructure is coming in or identifying pools uh, for insurance purposes. Um, shipping containers are another one. You want to get that daily trend of uh, the global economic activity. So uh, these are all pretty awesome, but if you look closely, um, True are used every day. Like True are in production at scale. Um, you know, they're promising proof of concepts, but I've definitely been waiting to see, you know, when is somebody going to use this in their process? Um, the, I realized, though, that there's actually an example that was recently written about of computer vision being used for real GIS at scale that's been successfully deployed for a couple of years. Um, I think in December there was this great blog post by uh, Justin about um, Google Maps and comparing it to Apple Maps and Google's advantages there. And their, their big advantage is uh, computer vision. Um, so you can see these are pulled from his post, um, this kind of incredible architecture detail that's pulled out in the upper left and lower right. Um, trailers are being able to identify it, and even the sheds behind houses are, are pulled out. Um, so they're doing this uh, totally automated. This algorithm is uh, so good it often runs ahead of the roads. On the, the map, you can see the road's only halfway done. The picture clearly has the road finished in all the buildings, but the buildings are up to date. Um, they're getting images uh, or buildings in towns of 100 people, you know, far from the urban cores that others do, and just this level of architectural detail of the antennas on top. Um, and from their press release on this, they, they, when they updated the buildings, they made it clear. They said, these building footprints complete with height detail are all algorithmically created by taking aerial imagery and using computer vision techniques to render the building shapes. Uh, this says to me that computer vision and machine learning remote sensing are, are already here. It's not some future concept that might work. Google's using it at scale, even if it's just for buildings. And I'm very much reminded by this quote by William Gibson. Um, Google's realized the power of computer vision, uh, and they're just living in this future that's not yet available to everybody else. It hasn't been distributed. Um, but going back to my opening statement, how are we going to bring this capability to everybody? How, I think it's time to start thinking about distributing that future to more than just Google. The coolest thing about this trend in deep learning uh, from the perspective of people into open like me is that most all the code powering these frameworks is open source. Google, Microsoft, Facebook, Amazon, Baidu have been investing huge amounts of money in deep learning 
But instead of keeping that code private, they're open sourcing their entire deep learning frameworks, um, as well as actual models. So you can take a model from them and that's trained on some data and adapt it to, to your problem. Um, one of the reasons for this is the, the field has been driven by academics traditionally, um, and they've enabled kind of true open collaboration across everybody. This is UNET, um, a, a published paper that's a, a really good image segmentation algorithm that's been applied to geospatial problems. Now, before you start thinking these companies are amazing altruists helping the world, um, I do want to explain what they do keep private. Um, the key to any good open strategy is to hold back one key piece that others can't easily replicate. And in the case of Google and others, it's what's called the labeled training data. Um, well, ImageNet has about a million images. Google has an internal data set with 300 million images. Um, and they published this paper uh, showing how just the more images you put at a problem, the better the algorithm does with fine tuning and without fine tuning. Um, so that's the piece they're, they're keeping private. Their Cloud Vision API, you know, anyone can tap into, use their, their AI to identify labels on images. This is one I put up, it identifies snow and winter and ski and it's pretty right on. Um, but that is not available to everybody. You can get the frameworks that run it, but the training data that went into it uh, is not available to everyone. So this labeled training data is what they keep private, and it's really a key to making the algorithms work, having sufficient data to describe what is in the images um, so they can learn. And I think this quote is right on. <clears throat> As the differentiator to most of the successful deep learning algorithms is lots of labeled training data. So we're never gonna replicate Google's Vision API unless we're gathering literally hundreds of millions of images. But the opportunity is to use those same algorithms and use those same models and frameworks, uh, but apply to Earth imagery. Um, if we build up labels for Earth imagery, we can tap into those investments. Um, for imagery, the chips end up looking something like this. This is um, planes. Um, chipped up into little pieces. This was made from Planet's Open California data set um, and then is used to, to train algorithms. Um, so I do want to pull back one level and, and emphasize that deep learning for geospatial is not just about imagery. Um, to truly identify valuable information of about objects, we're gonna to have to pull in a lot of other data sources. Um, so locations of ships and planes, which is billions of points, um, cell phone telemetry, where people are uh, just located, uh, you can extract out and aggregate and, and get a update for, for roads and, and other infrastructure. Um, and indeed, most every sensor on the Internet of Things can be spatially enabled. So there's just going to be billions and billions of points of data generated. Um, and the key is to fuse all these data sources together uh, using deep learning to make sense of them. Um, get to this real-time model of the world with lots of different inputs to get scalable object detection. Um, identify roads and chips from space, combine it with readings from cell phones, sensors, and other data sources. So now that we understand the two major trends reshaping the geospatial industry, we can return to this notion of queerable Earth, um, which promises to bring this power of geospatial insight to everyone. Um, I think this dashboard does really nicely communicate the high-level vision. Um, and while this user interface is interesting, what's most interesting to me and I think most people in this room is what's behind it? Um, you know, what do we need to do to make it a reality to go from the massive amounts of geospatial data to a simple dashboard with user notifications? Um, so Google's proven it's possible to, to fully automate the detection of new buildings at scale using computer vision. We need for Queryable Earth to do that with any object that can be identified in imagery. Um, and then we need to do it every single day. Um, you can see the immense amounts of human activity, um, you know, constant change. Um, this is made with the Planet Stories application um, and animated to, to just see that activity. And you want to be able to pull out information from that. Um, and then you want anyone to be able to uh, plug into the stream of data they care about. Not everyone wants all the information streaming at them. Uh, they might just care about ships. Give me some real-time updates about that particular thing because it's relevant to me. Um, 
And it's not just information, like I mentioned, or from imagery. Uh, AIS data complements um, detection from space to get the name of the ship and the destination. Um, Real-time traffic gives a picture of the conditions now. Cell phone telemetry can complement road detections from space. Um, so get to that near real-time model by, by fusing a bunch Activity of different sources. So this is another example of information feed uh, done with Planet Data by Raster Foundry. Um, and you can see the the ships are identified, but the, the really important thing is these trends. Um, you know, you want to look at what's happening in Singapore. Most users don't want to look at an image every single day. They just want to know what's happening broadly and be notified in a, uh, if anything has changed. Um, so an information feed abstracts remote sensing and GIS to just the information about the objects that can be queried. Um, I think the key is that it's data and software together. It's taking raw data, processing it, and making it available through an API that makes the data much easier to use. Um, with Google Maps, um, you know, I think Google Maps API is a great example of this. The, the software is relatively simple. Um, it was pretty easy for open source developers to, to replicate the uh, JavaScript cool map interface, but the value is the billions of dollars of data but then it's so easy to use because it's adapted to your, need, your needs. You don't have to download a whole bunch of data and sort it out. You get this really nice interface and programmatic way to, to access that. So I'd encourage us all to not get too fixated on either the software or the data. The power comes from both together. Um, and ultimately, the rest of the world wants good data, but they need geospatial experts uh, to put it into forms that are actually accessible and usable. So, to me, the goal is geospatial insight incorporated into every decision. Track your organization assets like you watch your Uber car. Uh, pull out higher level insights with ease. So how do we get to this queryable earth? Um, how do we build the infrastructure to support the information feeds constantly updating with valuable information? Um, I think the most important step is to make the geospatial world more accessible, modern, and yeah, open. Uh, there's a lot of pieces that go into this. Um, so information feeds are a slice of the pie. Uh, this is really a bunch of different building blocks. And this is the section of the talk we'll, we'll geek out a bit. I'll try to keep things fairly high level on each of them. Um, there's been a ton of great community effort on each of them, so I'd like to draw attention to each area, uh, but also attempt to stitch together how these work with one another to form the base infrastructure of this new vision of geospatial accessible by everyone. So. I think the first step is really uh, establish a bedrock of infrastructure on the cloud. I've been writing about this notion of cloud native geospatial, uh, which is not just using new tools like Kubernetes and the cloud native stack, but actually rethinking uh, how geospatial would look if it was built from the ground up for the cloud. Because uh, this queryable earth is not going to be built with desktop software. There is just too much data. It's terabytes and petabytes. Uh, you can't use anything but the cloud. You're not going to fit it on your desktop GIS. Um, so there's a, a few cornerstones of this cloud-native approach um, and a really great community effort to lay this foundation. Uh, the first is cloud-optimized GeoTIFF, also known as a COG. Um, it's entirely possible due to some awesome advances in GDAL, particularly creative use of VSI curl uh, to do remote calls to information. Uh, plus a, a special formatting of the GeoTIFF um, that enables this streaming access, just like a MP3 that you stream online. Um, Landsat on AWS was a, a precursor to this. Today, all planet data, uh, along with many new data sets, is available in the format. Uh, this is a site that shows COGS in action. I can just enter the URL of that piece of data directly online and get a map. It'll zoom into the map. I can go to full zoom level. Uh, I can share that with somebody else. Um, and this traditionally took a lot of processing, but you can just access the data directly. Um, it's backed by a scalable Lambda tiler, so running on AWS Lambda. Um, that means it can scale infinitely. It's run by Radiant Earth. This one, anyone can actually try out this tiles.rdnt.io um, and put your own COGS in there and get tiles into your web map. And there's growing support for COGS in a, a variety of software and data providers. Google Earth Engine now actually lets you take any operation that you can think of in their uh, engine and export it as cloud-optimized GeoTIFF. Uh, this is a call to composite and clip planet imagery in the Bay Area. 
uh, to a cog. Um, this is a slowed down image of how this composite works. Uh, they kind of select all the images and get to a cloud-free selection, um, and then it produces this three or four gigabyte file that uh, we can put online. Once that's online, uh, this is using the tiles.radiant.io. Um, this is a false color composite that's created on the fly because that cog was computed with its near IR channel. Um, and then we can render it right there. Um, the cogs can also be used by desktop GIS, or at least the cool open source ones so far, hoping proprietary GIS catches up. Um, Q just here demonstrates how the data can be streamed. Um, so yeah, typically you'd have to download a three gigabyte file, wait anywhere between two minutes and two hours and longer, depending on your connection, before you could start analyzing and working with it. This is actually streaming the real analytic bytes, so you can do analysis on it locally without having to download it all. Uh, and then one of the coolest advances is by the, the EOX guys in Austria, which is a pure JavaScript cloud-optimized GeoTIFF reader. Um, so, you know, people say serverless is so cool using Lambda. This actually uses even less servers than a, a serverless architecture. Um, it's just simply a cog on a cloud read directly with JavaScript. Uh, it pulls exactly the, the bits that it needs, and so you can do client-side analysis. You can do NDVI, because um, it gets the full data. It's not just the rendered image. Um, Azavia also just added the ability to import any cog into uh, their project called Raster Foundry. Um, so again, this is the exact same file that we're doing all these visualizations. Uh, with Raster Foundry, you, you import it, you just reference the cog, you can go to your project and then use all of their cool tools. So they have annotation, um, you can start to make your own labels uh, directly from that file. Um, and then you can also make use of their lab tools. Um, so these are pretty awesome. You can uh, put in a formula, this is uh, NDVI band math and then a, a water mask, um, just type it in like an equation. It then generates that into a, a GUI um, where you can hook it up to your project, you can move it around, you can share it, this kind of visual model builder of the processing you want to happen. Um, you select your bands, um, you can control the histogram color, um, but then with that, you can see any node on this network rendered um, right there. So uh, this is comparing the, the NDVI with the mask. And again, this is not downloaded, not in their system. This file is still sitting uh, on the cloud uh, where I put it, um, but they're able to do their, all their raster processing um, streaming directly. Um, so everyone's able to do what they want, utilizing just the bits that they need. Um, so the next piece of core infrastructure uh, for cloud-native geospatial is this collaborative spec called Spatial Temporal Asset Catalogs. Uh, the core idea came out of a discussion a few of us had at Phosphor G North America in 2015, um, which led to enable the simplest possible sharing of imagery. Just put a geotiff uh, stored on the cloud, ideally a cog, with JSON sidecar files and openly license it for any use. Um, Open Aerial Maps, a really cool project built on top of Open Imagery Network that lets anyone upload drone imagery for disasters. Um, it builds a nice RESTful API on top of the, the network um, and a, a nice GUI to utilize it. Stack came about uh, as every satellite imagery provider was making a RESTful imagery search API powering a GUI to search imagery. Uh, this is four of them, there's many more of them, and they're all really similar, but all slightly different. And, they all talk to an API, but those APIs you couldn't just write one client for. So a group of 23 people from 14 organizations met and hashed out a core spec of, can we just make this search operation a little more interoperable? Um, there's now implementations by Boundless, Planet, Harris, um, Seabers is a, a really cool sensor out of Brazil and China uh, that's all available in Stack and COG. Um, and the design principle behind Stack is to prioritize flexibility and ease of implementation in order to make it so far more data gets exposed. Uh, traditionally in the geo world, people stand up these large portals, like their individual data portal that you can go and download, and they're standing up indexes, they're standing up visualizations. Uh, this kind of says everyone shouldn't have to stand up their own database just to make their imagery available for search. Um, so let people just put it in this format. Um, so the core is a small JSON file. It can be shared statically or through a dynamic API you can choose. Um, 
And then this core record lets everything uh, that is online be represented as a web page. Um, so people can just refer to a single location. Right now, if I want a Landsat image, I can't just give you a web page to get it. You have to know how to access it and download it and use it. Uh, this enables me to point at a particular location online. Um, and this is a JavaScript school tool that runs on top of the JSON and generates this full HTML page uh, purely from putting it in the stack format. Um, and then if you have a, a Cloud Optimized GeoTIFF in there, it'll make a slippy map. Um, you know, you can zoom in and share it and actually use it in that location. Um, so stack and cog are really complementary pieces of technology. This page, um, it actually gives you a lot of what people use a desktop GS for. They just want to download and look at the image and you know see that there's flooding here. Uh, it also let you go full screen, share it with a friend. Um, so I really want to emphasize the, the kind of radical simplicity of these two technologies. Um, they make the data available and accessible, doing the simplest possible thing, and then other tech can grow and adapt and build cooler things on top of it. So I hope within a few years, we see most all imagery, both public and private, accessible as cogs and stacks. Um, so the next challenge is ensuring all imagery data produced is actually putting its best foot forward to computer vision specialists. Um, so I'm actually relatively new to the, the imagery uh, field, and I've been in the open source geo community for a while, but when I came to it, I was actually really surprised at how much time is spent on just getting the data ready for analysis um, and how intimidating it can be. You know, most of the work is on this stuff. Um, this is, you know, images that you get, and they're not aligned by pixel. You have to set them to align pixel by pixel on your own because most providers aren't doing uh, really pixel alignment. They're not going to co-register it for you. Um, we make people figure out the cloud masks. You know, yeah, most providers provide cloud masks, but most of them aren't usable, especially to a particular problem, and certainly not things like cloud shadows and haze. Um, we push that on the user to, to get the clouds out of their image. Um, atmospheric correction, you know, this uh, atmosphere is different every single day. It looks different, but we're expecting people to correct that themselves um, as opposed to uh, wrapping up a, a surface reflectance product for them. And we make people understand projections. You know, you're new to this field and uh, you don't understand why this image doesn't line up with image because its numbers are different in a different projection. Um, so let's kind of cut up tiles in ways that people can, can make use of. Um, to gather all these things, this sort of processing data in this way to make it so people can just use it is known as analysis-ready data. Um, so they can focus on their analysis problems at hand and not all that pre-processing. Um, and the next, there's a number of people that are starting to produce data like this. Uh, the next step is really to think about cross-provider analysis-ready data. There's Landsat, ARD, there's Sentinel ARD, um, but how do you uh, make it so all of those work together? Um, we're organizing a workshop to bring people together in August um, uh, from industry, government, and academia to, to try to create truly cross-provider ARD, um, hopefully establish some baseline standards that, that others can use. Um, so then the next piece of infrastructure is geoprocessing software that can scale. Um, there's a new breed of these cloud native engines uh, that can scale out to thousands of nodes to do processing, uh, be able to crunch this tsunami of data that's being generated. At Planet, we run 30,000 or more virtual machines just to crunch through the data coming from our constellation, um, and that's just a single constellation. Uh, it'll take even more machines to process the world's data. Um, the cool thing is that most all these engines use open source software at their core. Um, so they're really building on um, what's come before in the open source geospatial world. Um, and we need to continue to evolve the open source tools to be more cloud aware. Um, but super great that they're built on open source. Uh, and then we're also starting to explore new stacks that are built from the ground up for the cloud. Um, so hopefully there's more and more of that effort to, to really understand that cloud native compute. Um, and ideally, these systems are able to uh, deliver this ARD on demand. So instead of just producing an analysis-ready data once, let a user customize the parameters they want, get the ARD for their particular problem. Okay, so once you've got the, 
imagery properly formatted and accessible, the next piece we really need to get right uh, is this label training data that I mentioned before. Um, and I think it's a really fundamental piece to, to understand. Um, thankfully, there's been a number of, use, of organizations that are starting to build up these open databases of label training data. Um, they're primarily in service of a contest, a set of contests that they run, but they're keeping their databases open for people to continue to, to train on and, and build algorithms with. Um, and this is a great start, but, but I'd like to see us go even further. Um, there's a small early community of collaborators talking about the idea of aligning the various efforts, um, providing some clear guidelines for future efforts so that all the open data produced by different organizations can be used together in a single model as opposed to you know, a bunch of different classes done in different ways. Um, this can help us get uh, data from many different locations. Um, and ideally, you want an algorithm that works just as well in Atlanta and Cairo and Cape Town because it's got label training data in each of those. Um, so this key is to get this representative global sample. Um, I don't think these need to be massive mapping efforts. We don't need to attempt to map lots. We just need a, a few key areas that are different from one another really well labeled. Um, so thinking about one kilometer by one kilometer chips that have stacks of data over time that, that have a whole bunch of really good labels. Um, in many ways, this is kind of all the pieces previously mentioned coming together um, to power computer vision and deep learning algorithms. So it's the open imagery. Um, it's sampled into chips. Um, it's processed into analysis-ready data. That data is available as COGS to stream and use. Um, those are indexed in spatial temporal asset catalogs to be searched, while also used as a basis for these object labels. Um, and then, ideally, we have community-evolved ontologies, um, be able to share a meaning of a road, but also uh, define our own particular objects if we want, and then expose those all as GeoJSON in open formats that people can use. And this should be open for all uh, in a single, well-understood license for the data. Um, the, to build this, we need a, a community around this. Um, ImageNet was built with a community of people building it up. Um, you know, I think we can leverage OpenStreetMap, which is the leading community effort in uh, geospatial. Uh, with a few tweaks, it can align with this um, and get to really verified, validated, uh, labeled data. Um, we're also going to have to improve the tools to this, um, and I think it's really about kind of the, the people and the machines together. This is a, another example from Astro Foundry where the algorithm first uh, tries to identify ships, then the human comes in and verifies that that was a ship or not or are not sure. Um, and this type of labeling that is informed by the computer vision as opposed to just trying to do it from scratch I think is pretty powerful. Um, and then there need to be tools for people to create those labels. Um, you know, a computer vision person should have that all abstracted to them. They shouldn't have to worry about the details of GIS um, and have those work with all the common machine learning environments. Um, and then the final step for this ecosystem is, uh, you know, get to some open machine learning models. You can go to Google and get a generic image uh, model and clone that for your purposes. There should be a, a baseline set of models for Earth imagery that people can customize and tweak further. So the f true final step is to wrap all this great uh, infrastructure into interfaces that truly abstract out GIS and remote sensing. Uh, a normal developer shouldn't have to learn a bunch of special APIs just to make use of information derived from imagery. Um, and I believe these pieces are the the core of a queryable Earth infrastructure. Uh, we need that ARD processed uh, to stack and cog, using those machine learning models, and producing these information feeds. Um, uh, that's kind of our stuff to do. But that interface uh, to that world, I think, needs to be more accessible. Uh, we can't just make a, a bunch of different interfaces with tons of operations and expect the world to thank us for our incredible information. Um, this is all the specs at the Open Geospatial Consortium, um, but a few of us have been pushing the OGC to, to radically simplify their approach, improve the process to become more relevant to developers and to the world. Um, the first result of this effort is a, a new version of the web feature service specification. 
Um, I've got a soft spot in my heart for WFS because it's the first spec I ever worked on, and I think that version 1.0 wasn't so bad. They kind of got worse and worse, but uh, or just more and more that you had to implement. Uh, version 3.0 is a complete reboot that's far simpler even than WFS 1.0 was. Um, and the work's being done completely in the open, um, using tools and processes pioneered by open source developers, like using GitHub and their issue tracking and pull requests to actually create the spec. Um, they fully embraced open API as a way to specify uh, the endpoint with REST and JSON at the core. And a few months ago, we did a hackathon uh, at USGS in Fort Collins uh, and had a bunch of the open source geospatial community show up and that kind of uh, looking at the spec and implementing it makes me feel a lot better about the spec. Um, there were some really great open source contributions. Uh, the GeoPython crew showed up in force um, and has continued working on a really nice WFS3 implementation. As you can see, it's a lot more webby um, than previous versions. You can explore just by clicking around as opposed to having to read a big spec to even make your first call. Um, and we got to open layers front ends of various servers built during the hackathon, and there was a, a GDAL WFS plugin um, that uh, if people have started to use and integrate. Um, so I believe WFS3 has the potential to make the geospatial world more accessible to a broader group of developers. And it can be a basis for interoperable information feed APIs. There needs to be some extensions for things like notifications, but I think it's a, a powerful direction to pursue. Um, and there's really good momentum in OGC for WFS3 and indeed for redoing the standards baseline to take this more simple and accessible approach. Um, I know many people have been skeptical of OGC the last few years, and I certainly have been too, but I hope more of you will uh, join and help shape it to build the types of standards we're proud to share with the world. Um, Okay, so I just hit you with a lot of specific parts. Um, I want to tie this back to the overall goal. Um, to power the queryable Earth, we need advances in a number of directions. Uh, continue to work on cloud-native geospatial software, make data more accessible and open, create machine learning models um, that are open to automatically pull out information from images, um, and put those into APIs that any developer can understand and work to abstract out GIS and remote sensing. Um, so I showed part of this diagram before uh, how these pieces fit together, but the key is this piece added of the, the APIs and abstracting the GIS remote sensing. We need to do our work on queryable Earth, but then be sure that, that interface to everyone else uh, can be tapped into by, by anyone without geospatial expertise. Um, so I believe the geospatial world is going to be radically transformed by this explosion of data combined with deep learning and computer vision and this ability to automatically extract information from images. We're going to move from static maps uh, to near real-time dashboards of information. This is one of my favorite projects by Cardo, this dashboard that they did for the mayor of New York. Um, and, you know, maps are part of it, but the main interaction is this heads-up display. Um, you can dig into a map, but mostly you look at the overall view. And it's powered by weekly updates of information from the various departments, um, but soon it'll be able to do something like tap into planet feeds to show progress on construction, um, or get real-time telemetry from Uber or cell phone data to get a pulse of the city. So I'd like to end with a, a challenge for our Phosphor G community. Uh, instead of just trying to do a better job of what proprietary GIS does, let's go beyond. Let's take up a bold vision of what geospatial could be and make it integrated in everyone's lives. Um, let's aim for these information feeds powered by computer vision, built natively for the cloud, surfacing the world's information and fully interoperable with the broader tech world. Um, let's build this infrastructure for queryable Earth, um, providing an up-to-date living model of the state of our planet that anyone can tap into. And it may be obvious, but it's worth underscoring that this queryable Earth vision won't be possible without collaboration across the entire geospatial industry. Uh, it's more than a single company can possibly accomplish, and that means all of you. Um, and I believe this is really important. Um, the, the problems of the world are now interconnected uh, with drastic changes to our planet happening every day, but many of those changes pass by unnoticed. Um, I'm certain this group of people can have a momentous impact on the world, 
And indeed, I fear for the world's survival if we're not able to get an accurate pulse and MRI scan and X-ray and sonogram for what is happening. So I want to thank each of you for any geospatial open source code you have built, as it's truly the foundation of uh, the future of geospatial. Um, and I'm excited for you to keep working away at the ground level, as we need that solid infrastructure. And I encourage us as a community to look beyond this current paradigm of GIS to build cloud-native infrastructure and embrace computer vision to, to leapfrog what's come before. I believe that open source will help define the future of geospatial, and I believe our community's impact on the future of the planet has only just begun. Thank you.